Golden Radio Hour. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. today, Lou. I can tell. Yeah? How can you tell, Tommy? Because you're the best salesman there is. Well, maybe I used to be. You are, Lou. You always have such neat stuff. Oh, yeah, I got everything. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Something for everybody. Help me set up the table, will you, Tommy? Sure. There we go. We'll be ready to start in a minute. What's in the bag today, Lou? Take a look. See anything you like? Lots of toys! Always. Which one's your favorite? Um, let's see. The little wind-up dogs. They're so cute. And the monkeys? And the zap gun. It's cool. Pow, pow, pow! I thought I gave you one to test for me. You did, but, well, it kind of broke. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I'll give you another one later. How you doing today, Bookman? Oh, just fine, officer. Another day, another dollar. You know how it is. Gonna sit up right here in the corner? I thought I might, yes, if that's all right with you. Well, just don't block the sidewalk. People coming and going. I wouldn't think of it, officer. Or you'll have to move. You don't want a citation, do you? Oh, absolutely not. All these busy people can't hold up commerce. You know, Bookman, maybe you should find yourself another line of work. Streets are so busy these days, there ain't much room for a pitch man anymore. Isn't that the truth? You got a permit, don't you? Why, I'm sure I do. Now, where did I put it? Oh, yes, it's in my other jacket. Would you, would you like me to go get it for you, officer? Uh, just be sure you bring it next time. I will, I will. Thank you, officer. Good day to you. Hey, honey, look at these cute stuffed animals. They are, aren't they? Absolutely adorable. Here, let me wind up one for you. How much? Only, uh, seven ninety-eight. in your choice of colors. Do you have any little ones at home, sir? Nope, no kids. Well, a niece or nephew, then. These make great birthday presents, stocking stuffers, a big hit at parties. Have you ever seen anything so delightful? Look at the way they move. It is cute, don't you think, Walter? Yeah, but they got them over at the pick and save for three bucks. Oh. Now, these aren't your ordinary toy animals. No, ma'am. They walk and talk and bark and jump a full 360 degrees in the air. Plus, you never have to feed them or take them to the vet. I call them the ideal pet. Go ahead, pick it up. Feel that fur, so soft and lifelike. Thank you, anyway. They're on sale. Spe Special July clearance. Everything's half off today. Gift items for the men. Perfume for the ladies. How about a wristwatch? Did you see these genuine gold necklaces? Street scene. Summer. The present. Man on a sidewalk. Age, 60-ish. Occupation, pitch man. Name, Lou Bookman. A regular fixture for the summer... The kind you pass by every day and don't pay much attention to anymore. A rather minor component to a hot July in the city. A nondescript, commonplace little man with a wrinkled suit, a pork pie hat, and a loud necktie that always seems to be coming loose at the collar. A man whose life is a treadmill built out of sidewalks and street corners everywhere. Lou Bookman, a walking rebuttal to the American dream, which states that success can be carved gouged or grubbed out of the landscape no matter where you are, whether it be log cabins or tenement buildings. Because Lou Bookman has not even a nodding acquaintance with success, and his dreams only extend from the curb to where the sidewalk ends. But in just a moment, Lou Bookman will have something to occupy his time which transcends both success and failure. He'll have to concern himself with survival. As of three o'clock this hot afternoon, Mr. Bookman will be stalked by his toughest customer to date, a man in a black suit who 
who's out to close a deal of his own and who won't take no for an answer in the Twilight Zone. And now, back to our story from the Twilight Zone. One for the Angels, starring Ed Begley Jr. with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Sir, how about a nice new pen? Guaranteed to write upside down, underwater, in zero gravity. Ma'am, let me give you a free sample of my new perfume. It's called Scent of Mystery, and I promise it will bring you all the love and romance you ever dreamed of. How about you, sir? Nothing for me. No? You sure? I'm just observing. The reason I ask is you've been standing there for quite a while. Are you quite sure I can't show you anything? What about a new digital watch? Comes in a gift box. Not today, Mr. Bookman. Oh, you know my name. Have I seen you before? You look... Who are you talking to, Lou? What? Oh, that man there in the black suit. Which man? The one standing by the... Well, I don't see him now. He must have moved on. Strange, don't you think? To be wearing a black suit on a day like this. It's getting awful late. Is it really? I gotta get home before my mom gets mad. You run along then, Tommy. You absolutely, positively can't be late for dinner. You gonna have dinner now, too? Sure, Maggie, sure. Guess it's about that time. What are you gonna have? Oh, a lovely repast, no doubt. The chef's special. We're having spaghetti and meatballs. My favorite. Sounds positively scrumptious. I think I have a can left myself. I hope you put your stuff away. Oh, don't worry. I can do it. Hey, Lou, can I walk with you? That would be my pleasure, Maggie, to be in the company of such a pretty girl like yourself. Hey, Lou! Hey, Lou! Hey, it's Lou. It's Lou. What's going on, Lou? Hey, want to play with us, Mr. Bookman? Come on! I'd love to, children, but I must get home to my plants. Delicate creatures, you know. Your plants? My wisterias. They've been cooped up in this heat all day. Oh, so what? Show us some toys. And magic tricks. I don't have much magic left. And the zip gun. I want to see the fuzzy doggies. Carrie, is that a new bathing suit? Yeah. Well, don't you look nice. And Bobby, where have you been? I haven't seen you all week. I was sick. Then you shouldn't play in the water like that. Oh, uh, I'm all better now. Let me feel your forehead. Why, what's this? A quarter stuck behind your ear. No wonder you were sick. Wow! Oh, me, me, come me, on. me, me, please, me, please, me, please, me, come on, me. I don't think anybody else has a temperature, but maybe you could test these. Let me see, these rings to be sure they're okay. Oh, yes, yes. toys! Yes. Oh, they may look like toys, but they're not toys you can buy at the Five and Dime. Anybody can sell toys, but these, these, my young friends, are very, very special. Did you know they're among the wonders of the world? Go ahead, Lou. Give them the pitch. <clears throat> Young ladies and gentlemen, the rings you now have on your fingers come from a remote corner of the Tibetan mountain country. Do you know where that is? No. no. Well, it's where the wisest people in the world live. The jewels are patterned, shaped, and forged by strange little men who work underground, far from the light of day. Some folks call them... The Moly Men! Right, Bobby, the Moly Men. They use magic words and incantations to produce what look like toys. But each and every one they make has extraordinary powers. What kind of powers? The power to keep a person young forever. Science can't explain it. Your teacher wouldn't believe it. Your mother and father either. But it's true. And when the moly men are finished, they... They say the magic words. Uh, mini, mini... Mini, mini tackle. Words that hold a strange power from another world. The power of the life force. Watch the jewel in the ring. When it changes color, something is about to happen. You'll get your wish. So remember, be careful what you wish for tonight, children, because it's absolutely, positively going to come true. You know what, Mr. Bookman? You're my best friend. No, he's not, Bobby. He's my best friend. See you later, children, for the Bookman ice cream cone and social hour after dinner. Same time, same place. Don't forget now. We won't. We won't. Come on, Lou. I gotta go home. That you, Mr. Berkman? Good evening, Mrs. Magnuson. Hiya, Lou. Need a hand? That's all right, Mr. Stolberg. I got it. You make out okay today? Oh, yes, as always. Sold out half my merchandise. Yeah? Looks like you got a whole lot left. 
Want to come over for a cold one? That's kind of you, but I'm on the wagon these days. Well, I'll keep one on ice for you anyway. Hello, my beautiful Wisterias. And how have all you been today? Did you say you're thirsty? I'll bet you are. Here, have a drink of water on me. Not too much now. Mr. Bookman? Oh, you could give a man a heart attack sitting there like that. I didn't mean to startle you. Say, how did you get in my apartment? I let myself in. But you couldn't. I keep it locked. You are Louis J. Bookman, aren't you? That's right. Something I can show you? I don't think so. Something in, let me see, collar stays, maybe, or neckties. You look like a man who needs a new tie, something brighter than the one you're wearing. Mr. Bookman, I'm not here to buy anything. Then what in the world do you want? Let's get down to business, shall we? Yes, here it is. Louis J. Bookman, age 69, right? 70 in September. Well, I must say you don't look it. <laughs> nice of you to say so, young man. I try to keep busy. Occupation pitch man, correct? Are you a census taker? If you are, let me sit down. I hope this doesn't take too long. Not exactly. Born in New York City? That's right. Father Jacob Bookman, Mother Flora. Father's place of birth, Detroit, Michigan. Mother's place of birth, Syracuse, New York. My, you have it all down in that book of yours, don't you? We have to keep these things efficient. Now, today is the 19th of July, and your departure is at midnight tonight. My departure? Excuse me. Go right ahead. Hi, Maggie, darling. My doggies broke, Lou. Let me see. Oh, here's your trouble right here. See this little cogwheel? You pushed down on the key when you were winding it. Can you fix it? I can try. So smart, you can do anything. Hear that, mister? Mm-hmm. I'd introduce you two, but I don't know your name. No need. I think I got it now, Lou. Thanks. You're very welcome. Oh, this gentleman has come here to ask me a lot of questions. You, you're not the police, are you? Hardly. Oh, kind of gave me a turn. Huh? I'm glad he's not the police. I've got my vendor's license here somewhere. I thought maybe I forgot to renew it or something. Who's the police, Lou? This gentleman here. What gentleman? That one in the other chair. Which chair? Mr. Bookman, she can't see me or hear me. Why not? Why not what, Lou? Why can't you see him or hear him? See who? I it works great now, Lou. Thanks a lot. See you after supper, huh? Wait a minute. What about our manners? Aren't you going to say goodbye? Oh, yeah. Goodbye, Lou. Thanks. I mean to the gentleman. Oh, it's a game. I get it. The Invisible Man. Goodbye, Mr. Invisible Man. See you, Lou. I can see you, yet she can't. Only those who are to accompany me can see me. Understand my words, Mr. Bookman? Only those who are to accompany me. I'm still not sure I... Now then, don't you think you'd better start making your arrangements? Arrangements for what? For your departure. My departure where? You still don't get it. I just never understand you people. You get this idiotic notion that life goes on forever, and of course it doesn't. Everyone has to go sometime. Go? You don't mean... That's right. No, that's ridiculous. I don't have time. I'm a busy man, a very busy man. Let me make you a cup of tea before you go. No, thank you. Take a look around. You can see how busy I am. My flowers, for example. I have a green thumb. Whatever I touch, well, it grows. If I do say so myself, I won second prize last year at the YMHA Flower Show. See the plaque on the wall? Wisteria, open class. Oh, nice. Nice? Is that all you can say? Look at them, will you? You've never seen flowers like these. And what I further don't understand is how little you appreciate the nature of your departure. I thought we were finished with that subject. Think of the poor souls who go in violent accidents. These are the non-precognition victims. We're not permitted to forewarn them. 
You, on the other hand, Mr. Bookman, fall under the category of natural causes. Natural causes? What's natural about it? As opposed to accidents, car crashes, things like that. You know, I find you a devious sort of fellow. Very devious. Not to say dishonest. In what way? I can see it in your eyes. You don't want to look at me. To tell the truth, I'm not sure I like you very much. Why don't you just come out with it and say what's on your mind? Mr. Bookman, I have done everything but phone your own undertaker. How much clearer do you want it? If you still don't know who I am... Don't touch my flowers. If you need an illustration... I told you, don't touch them. I thought this might erase any doubts. You touched one and it wilted and... and died right there on the spot. Sorry. That was unavoidable. It actually turned black. Do you mean your... death? <sighs> exactly, Mr. Bookman. Now, shall we get down to business? Time of departure is midnight tonight. I trust that will suit you. Did you say tonight? The preordination is for death during a nap. I presume this, too, will meet with your approval. What if it doesn't? You'll find this a relatively simple and painless and barely noticeable... Please, I don't want to go... They never do. But I can't go yet. For one thing, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm a healthy man. Outside of a cold last winter and an infected splinter, I don't think I've been sick a day in the past 20 years. Be that as it may, the departure time is set for midnight, and at precisely midnight, it will be. Don't I have anything to say about that? Not as such. We are, however, required to consider appeals. What kind of appeals? Uh, there are three categories. So I need to fill out a form, right? Give me one and I'll start right in on it. No forms. We listen to what you have to say up to a point, but frankly... What are the categories again? Frankly, Mr. Bookman, I must tell you that I see very little here in the way of an extenuating circumstance. In any event, there are three major categories of appeals. One is hardship cases. What kind of hardship? Do you have a wife or family who might suffer your demise beyond a reasonable degree? No. No family. Second category is priority cases. Statesmen or scientists, primarily. Men on the verge of discoveries. I take it you're not working on any major scientific pursuit at the moment. No, I'm not. What about the third category? Well, Mr. Bookman, that would be unfinished business of a major nature. I don't know how major this would seem to anyone else. Go on. But I've never made a truly successful pitch. A sales pitch? Oh, surely you must have many times over if that's your profession. Yes, it's what I do, and I've managed to get by after a fashion. But I never hit it just right, you know? I'm not sure I... The man I learned from back in the Carney, he had it. He could sell igloos to the Eskimos. But what I'm talking is a big pitch. One where it finally all comes together and and the words just flow off my tongue. Not just any words either. Something I believe in. Something so good that people won't have a choice. They'll have to listen. A pitch so big the sky will open up. A pitch for the angels. I guess that wouldn't mean much to you. But it would mean a great deal to me. It would mean... It would mean that I could have one moment in my whole life when I was successful at something. Just one moment when the children would be able to... to be proud of me. The children? I've always had rather a fondness for children. That's in the record. Then you know how I feel. Not precisely, but... The problem here, Mr. Bookman, is that you'd require a delay until... Until I could make a pitch. The kind of pitch I told you about. One for the angels. That's right. I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Bookman. You see... These categories are fairly specific and... I see. And when reference is made to unfinished business of a major nature, well, the only interpretation to be made here is simply that... That my business isn't major enough. That's not quite the way we look at it. That I'm not, then. What other way is there to look at it? What I mean is that, unfortunately, Mr. Bookman, the ability to achieve success in a given professional venture is hardly of a significant... I get it. You don't have to spell it out. I'm small potatoes, and who cares what happens to a potato? They're nothing special. We try to approach each case on an individual basis. Only some are more individual than others. Oh, don't worry about it. I've heard the same thing all my life. We go out the way we came in. Since I never had that much to start with, 
That's how I'm supposed to leave. It's not your fault. You're just doing your job. It means a great deal to you, does it? You could say that. Uh-huh. It would be highly irregular. So is this whole thing, if you ask me. But under the circumstances, I believe we might... Yes? We might be able to grant you a one-time delay, Mr. Bookman. A conditional one, you understand. Until? What do you mean, until? Until you've made this, this pitch you're talking about. I can stay alive until then? That's the arrangement. I'll have to think of some way to write it up. You do that. As for me, I think it's a fine bargain. More than generous, frankly. It's been awfully nice talking to you, mister. I didn't get your name. About this pitch, Mr. Bookman. Yeah? When might we expect it? When? <laughs> soon, soon. What does soon mean to you? That's hard to say. Gets into definitions, doesn't it? You have a dictionary with you? No, I didn't think so. But it's a pretty simple word when you get right down to it. Soon means in the near future, the very near future. Not right away, though. And after a while, it's all relative, isn't it? Soon compared to what? A week? A month? A whole life? Mr. Bookman. That's open to interpretation, you see. So my answer to you is, maybe not this year, maybe not next year either, but soon. Mr. Bookman, I have a very odd feeling that you're taking advantage of us. Do you? Do you really? <laughs> That's a pity. Because I am. Mr. Bookman. I just won't make any pictures at all. Didn't think of that, did you? As long as it's up to me, I won't even hardly open my mouth. I don't have to if I don't want to. That's the term, so you run along now. Think you'll get me, huh? Well, I have no intention of... Really, Mr. Bookman? How did you get back in here? I locked you out. This is much more serious than you imagine. I have to go now. I promised to meet the children. We have a kind of social club, you know. Ice cream and stories. Lots of stories. Right down there on the stoop. It's much more complex than you realize what you've just done, what you think you've done. See you sometime. I'll let you know when. Here we've gone out of our way to help you, and this is the way you repay us. Bye now. Mr. Bookman, it won't just end here, you understand. There'll be consequences. You'll see. FYI, that means for your information. You have made your bed, and you shall now sleep in it. You say I won't go until I make the pitch? Well, all right. You'll have to wait till I make the pitch. And young man, and this I can say to you without fear of contradiction, you have got a long wait. That may well be, Mr. Bookman. But since you won't come with me, we've been forced to select an alternative arrangement. What happened? He didn't even stop. Ran right out. Not his fault. I swear I didn't even see her. She just jumped off the curb. I didn't have a chance to hit the brakes. Has someone called a doctor? Who got it? Oh no, Maggie! I swear to you, I never had a chance to stop. Call an ambulance. You're gonna be all right, Maggie, darling. Oh, my little Maggie. Uh, hi, Lou. See? You're gonna be just fine. Lou? Who's that man? What man? Where? I told you, Mr. Bookman. Consequences. You can't take her. No, sirree, you can't take her. I'll go. I'll go as planned. Never mind the pitch. I don't even want to wait. I want to go right away. Go where? Who's he talking to? What man? He's out of his head. Mr. Death! Mr. Death, come back! <laughs> you mustn't take the little girl. I'll go, please, please, Mr. Death, you win. I'll go with you. Right here. Right now. <laughs> I wonder how she is. A little girl? Yeah, how is she? Poor Mrs. Polanski. Look, here comes the doctor. How is she, Doc? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? She's a mighty sick little girl. Brave, too. Shouldn't she be in a hospital? That's just it. There's no particular trauma. In fact, there's hardly a mark on her, except where she fell and scraped her knee. Then what is it? Something's going on with her... Her fighting spirit, as it were. That's not a medical term, of course. But I think we'll know in a few more hours. If she hasn't hit a crisis by then, I'll move her to a hospital bed. A few more hours? Around 12 o'clock. 12 midnight, you mean? I think by then we'll know. He won't get in. Who, Mr. Bookman? I'm going to wait right here, so he can't get in.
come to bed, Mrs. Polanski. I can't. I have to take care of my baby. There's nothing you can do. That's what the doctor said. She just needs rest. I can't sleep. How could I? Lo? Where are you, Lo? Is that Mr. Bookman she's dreaming about? Such a nice man. He's like a grandfather to her. But he can't help her now. My precious little Maggie. Lo? Help me. Come on in, Lou. It's late. I'm waiting for someone. No, you're not. You're worried about the kid. And I don't blame you. She's a swell little girl. But there's nothing to do now but wait. What time you have? 11.40. Everybody's gone to bed now. You better do the same. Not yet. Take my advice. Give it a rest. 11.40, huh? Better get set up. Who's there? Good evening, Mr. Bookman. Thought I'd see you again. You got business inside? I most certainly do. It's a quarter to twelve. In fifteen minutes it will be midnight. The time of my appointment. Mr. Death, the little girl's only six years old. Please, you don't have to do it. I'm ready. I'm sorry, Mr. Bookman. But I'm ready now. We had to make another arrangement. It's impossible to change at this point. She's to come with me. So you see, I must be in there at midnight. And if you're not in there by midnight? <laughs> that would be pretty much unheard of. If I didn't get there at precisely 12 a.m., then the whole timetable would be upset. Oh, my, no. It's unheard of. Nice pocket watch you have there. But have you thought about digital technology? A wristwatch? It's more efficient. If you ever need a good one... What are you doing, Mr. Bookman? What am I doing? Oh, nothing. Just setting up a pitch is all. At this time of night? Oh, I very often have a late night sale. Very often. Not many customers out and about. <laughs> they come, they show up. You're here, aren't you? <laughs> oh, yes, I'm here. But I'm afraid I... I'm not much of a customer. How do you know? Have you ever seen my stock? Now you take a tie like this one right here. Like what? Like this tie. Looks like a toy dog to me. Oh, excuse me. Here, this is what I meant. Now you take this tie. I already have several. Go on. What does it look like to you? It looks like a tie. Feel it. Mm-hmm. So? If you'll feast your eyes, my good man, on what is probably one of the most exciting inventions since atomic energy, a simulated silk so fabulous as to mystify even the ancient Chinese masters, not to mention the silkworms, a perfection of detail, an awesome attention to fit and finish, a piquant interweaving of gossamer softness, absolutely and positively the smoothest substance ever to embrace the human neck. If it's as synthetic as you say... Come closer. I can't hear you. How did the manufacturer get it so soft? It's the thread, of course. The thread? I'll answer all your questions in just a moment, but first let me explain the applications of this magnificent invention. Now witness a unique demonstration of tensile strength. Feel this, sir. Go ahead, take it between your fingers, like touching the thinnest spider web. Is it not like holding the air you breathe in the palm of your hand? Now give it a yank. If you wish. There, you can't break it. As strong as steel, and yet as delicate as shantung silk. No mere synthetic substance, but a molecular blend of atoms the like of which has never been seen. Actually, it is surprisingly strong. Where did you say this was made? Let me answer your question, sir. Hey, Lou, what you doing down there? Come on, you gotta see this. Yeah, no kidding. It's really something. Do you have a scarf made out of this stuff? Scarves, blouses, I've got them all on order. You can't hurry the process. Picture, if you will, 300 years of backbreaking research and development to produce the ultimate thread. The witch, then which there is no witcher. And what will you pay for this fabulous, I say fabulous, incredible and amazing achievement of the tailor's art? Softer than the feathers of an angel's wings. Expensive, no doubt. Twenty dollars? Too rich for my blood. Ten dollars. Five. You might indeed pay that much and more. If you were to purchase this at a retail store, consider the markups, import fees, but this exquisite thread is not available in any store. How did you get it, then? Ah, 
I have connections in the government, you see. It's smuggled in from behind the bamboo curtain by oriental birds specially trained for ocean travel. Each one carries a minute quantity in a small capsule underneath their ruby throats. It takes 832 separate crossings to supply enough thread to go around one single spool. But tonight, as a special Get Acquainted offer, and to help advertise the product, I'm giving away a limited number, a very limited number, not at $20, not at 10 or even 5 but at the ridiculously low price of $1 a spool. If... You promise to take it home, test it out, and tell your friends. I'll take all you have. No, you don't. What about me? I gotta have some of that for my wife. Wait, that's not all. Everyone who purchases a spool of this thread gets a free bonus pack of imported sewing needles and a gold anodized thimble. One size fits all. Gather in close now. You got change, Lou? Sure I do. You, ma'am. Sir. Yarn, simulated cashmere socks, the most marvelous plastic shoelaces that never wear out. A genuine static electricity filter fits any car radio. I gotta go. No more cash. Me too, if I can carry all this stuff. Suntan oil, nose hair clippers, eczema powder, athlete's foot eradicator. I am getting sleepy, Mr. Bookman. Good night, and thanks. Wait till I show my daughter what I got. How about you, sir? Hmm? Oh, uh, I have so many things now... I don't know how I'm going to bring it all back. One last item, especially for you. The piece de resistance. An item never before offered in this or any other country. I can't imagine what else you could possibly show me. One live, guaranteed, genuine human manservant. How's that? For what I ask of you, sir. You receive a willing, capable, worldly, highly sophisticated, wonderfully loyal right-hand man to be used in any capacity you see fit. Say again? I don't... Louis J. Bookman at your service. The last model of his kind. He comes to you with an absolute guarantee. All parts interchangeable. A certificate of extended warranty. Eats little, sleeps little, rests only a fraction of the time. And there he is at your elbow, ready to do your bidding, at your beck and call whenever needed. Mr. Bookman, you are a persuasive man. I challenge any other store, industry or wholesale house, to even come close to matching what I offer you here. Because, my dear man, I am offering... I am offering you... Midnight. It's midnight, and I've missed my appointment. Oh, thank you, Doctor. It's a miracle. Just give her the sedatives every three hours, Mrs. Polanski. All she needs now is rest. But she's going to be all right. One minute past twelve, Mr. Bookman. And you made me miss my appointment. Thank God. A most persuasive pitch, Mr. Bookman. An excellent pitch. It had to be to make me lose track like that. The best I've ever done. The kind of pitch I've always wanted to make. A big one. So big, so big the sky would open up. A pitch for the angels. That's right. A pitch for the angels. I guess... I guess it's my time now. As per our original arrangement. Well... I'm ready. After you, Mr. Bookman. What is it? You'll excuse me for a minute. I forgot something. My folding table. You never know who might need something up there. It is up there. Up there, Mr. Bookman. No need to worry about that. You made it. Louis J. Bookman, age 60-ish, formerly a fixture of the summer, a rather minor component to a hot July, but throughout his life a man much loved by the children, and therefore a most important man. Couldn't happen, you say? Probably not in most places, but it did happen in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. 
where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. One for the Angels, starring Ed Begley Jr., with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Rich Kamenick, Lauren Patton, Linda Ryder, Richard Hensel, Doug James, Adam Tangway, Martin Hughes, Meg Thalken, Roger Wolski, Carl Amari, and Irene Olson. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. <laughs>